Welcome to Season 6 of Far Reach Voyages, where we share our love of offshore sailing and adventure travel. I'd like to take a minute to thank the many people who have watched our videos, and especially those who have commented, liked, and subscribed. It's been rewarding to interact with you in the comment section. But after creating and posting nearly 40 videos over the last 14 months, the channel has simply not grown as much as I hoped it would. I recognize Far Reach Voyages fills a very small niche, not only on YouTube, but especially among sailing channels. For those that don't know, the reality is, for the channel to grow, the algorithm used by YouTube to promote the channel is based on a number of factors, but primarily the number of subscribers, likes, and shares. It's just math. Most viewers probably can appreciate it takes a ridiculous amount of time to record, edit, and upload a video, usually about 15 to 20 hours. So I ask your help in continuing to grow the channel. It's pretty easy. If you enjoy the video and you want to see more of them, take a few seconds to comment and like. Subscribing and sharing, however, remain the best way to support the channel. In the meantime, we'll continue to share our insights on how to safely voyage offshore without drama on a simple, elegant boat, easy and affordable to maintain, and strong enough to take you anywhere you want to go. With that out of the way, let's get to the next episode. This video is all about winch pads. I'll describe how the pad design originated, how and why they changed over time, and finally, how I built the new pads. I now view as the ideal design for the Far Reach. When I rebuilt the Far Reach from a gutted hull, I was faced with many complicated projects. From rebuilding the entire interior to glassing over the hull deck joint. From designing and installing the raised bulwarks to designing and building a new rig. One of the simpler projects, however, was to repair the teak winch pads original to the boat. When I gutted the far reach, I took the winches and pads off and looked them over. Though the teak pads were in bad shape, I thought I could repair them later without too much difficulty and thus spend my energy and time on higher priority projects. When it was finally time, I realized the joints were just too loose for any glue other than epoxy. So I used epoxy along with graving pieces to put them back together. While epoxy is excellent for gap filling, especially with loose joints, it's not always the best glue when subject to heat, salt water, and high variation of temperatures. At the time, though, it seemed a reasonable approach given the more important projects I needed to complete if I was ever going to get the far reach back into the water. My initial running rigging plan for the jib sheets was to lead them to snatch blocks on the 7-inch tall bulwark and then directly to the primary winches. To get a good sheet angle on the winch, I installed bare teak riser pads on top of the base pad to raise the winches high enough to avoid an override. But during my first voyage to the Virgin Islands, I began to incorporate a foot block near the fantail for the jib sheets to run to and then turn 180 degrees back to the winch. This quickly proved to be a much better setup. And so, the riser pads were no longer needed. I didn't like the riser pads on the primary winches anyway because they raised the winches up so high they were an obstacle when entering and exiting the cockpit. A lower profile would be safer and also look better. For me, when it comes to boats, form and function go together. After I returned home from the Virgin Islands in 2016, I removed the primary winch pads and built new ones. This time I glued them up with Aerodux 185, an advanced type of resource and all glue, which I feel is better suited than epoxy to this kind of project. I also decided to add silicon bronze plates to the top of the primary winch pads. Bronze is a fairly easy metal to work. It's easy to cut with jigsaw and it's also easy on drill bits. It can be shaped with simple hand files. Best of all, it doesn't rust, ever. And it doesn't need to be polished if you enjoy its natural patina. Though the original Lumar 2-speed number 44 winches were still serviceable, Lumar had foolishly combined aluminum jaws with bronze drums. Unsurprisingly, there was some corrosion between the two dissimilar metals. So I completed the project by replacing the 44s with much improved and easier to maintain Lumar Ocean Series bronze 2-speed 46s. 
So I made no modifications at that time to the secondary winch pads, the ones that primarily support the staysail. I did replace the non-self-tailing Lumar 16s with more capable self-tailing Lumar Ocean Series 16s. I also still needed the risers on the forward position winches so the drums would remain above the top of the combings. Adding the bronze plates eliminated the need to varnish the top of the winch pads. Varnish on any horizontal surface can take a beating from the sun's harmful UV rays, especially when the sun is directly overhead. Also, the varnished pads suffer abuse from salt-encrusted lines being dragged over them, for example, when tacking the boat. The bronze plates add a lot of protection and also serves as a natural cut line with varnishing, so it provides multiple benefits. I also think the blue-green patina looks great next to the varnished combings and the bare teeth cap rails. Over the next five years of sailing, this modification proved itself quite beneficial. This past year, when I rebuilt the combings, I decided it was time to also make the same modifications to the staysail winch pads. So along with the combings, I removed the winch pads and the teak risers. Though the secondary winch pads were seven years old and had 11,000 ocean miles on them, they were in perfect shape because I originally glued them up with resource and all. So I thought I could reuse them. With the winch pads in the shop, I needed to remove the radius top edge. After thinking about the best way to do it, I decided to build a simple jig to hold the pads secure and then ran them through the thickness planer to take about a quarter inch off the top. Though I removed the round teak riser, I still needed a height for the forward position secondary winches so they would not be located below the top of the combing, which is taller at the front of the cockpit. The added height also helps maintain a proper staysail sheet angle. With the top of the base flat, the next step was to glue on an extension. I couldn't find any affordable 2 inch thick offcuts. The best solution was to glue together some 1 inch thick teak scraps left over from other projects. As before, I used Aeroduct's 185 Resource and All glue. Once the glue had cured, I glued the new 2 inch thick piece to the existing winch pads. Once cured, I took the pads to a friend's bandsaw and cut as close to the original base as possible. With the pads back in the shop, I used an inexpensive bench top sander to sand the extension flush. I decided to add a slight bevel to the now taller pad so they'd have a more refined look. Once I was satisfied with the shape, I used my trusty Bosch jigsaw with bimetal blades I bought at Lowe's Hardware to cut quarter inch thick silicon bronze plate to fit the top of the winch pad. Unlike stainless steel, silicone bronze is fairly easy to cut. Once satisfied with the shape, I marked the holes so the plates would line up with the winch and the holes in the base. I drilled the holes using standard metal cutting drill bits with the drill speed set on the slowest possible setting. I had cut the plates slightly oversized so I could file them to fit the way I wanted. I then used a Makita 4.5 inch right angle high speed grinder to remove the rough edges from the jigsaw and refine the shape and fit of the plate. Next I used a metal mill file to smooth the edges to a slight radius edge. This is easy relaxing work. I filed and test fit and filed some more till the plate stood about an eighth inch proud of the winch pads, a small lip if you will, to serve as a cut line when varnishing the winch pads once they're installed. On the side of the base that fits against the combing, I made the plates about an eighth inch short so there would be room for caulking between the plate and the combing. We're going to use a die to clean the threads off on this bolt. You can see the old caulk that's caked on here. These are quarter 20. And I just put a little lubricant on there. Put the die on. I 
it the same way I cut threads too. But today we're just chasing them. Chasing the threads is what it's called. Just cleaning them out. And that'll make putting the nut on there a lot easier. Because when you go to tighten it, you're not fighting all that dried bedding compound. I really enjoy metalworking. Like varnishing, I find it relaxing. I can accomplish a lot with my very limited metalworking skills. You don't have to be an expert in every area to reap the benefits of focus skill development. Sometimes it's perfectly fine to be a mile wide and a couple of inches deep if it meets your needs. And because bronze is also much easier work than stainless steel, you don't have to invest in expensive tools and specialty drill bits and cutting blades. With the winch pads completed, I took them to the boat and test fit them along with the new combings to ensure everything fit properly. Satisfied with the fit of the plates, it was time to put a slight radius on the top edge of the winch base. Along with the proud edge of the bronze plate, and I found a small radius edge provides a better cut line when varnishing so I don't have to tape off the edge of the plate. For this task, I used a pattern maker's file, sometimes called a cabinet maker's file. I have two both made by Nicholson. I've used these files extensively for 13 years and relied on them heavily when building the interior of the boat. They're workhorses and well worth the money. I only use them on wood. One is for aggressive wood removal and the other is more refined. I follow file use with appropriate grits of abrasive sandpaper to remove any file marks. Finally, it was time to lay on a couple of coats of varnish to protect them during installation. Here they are with five coats of varnish. You can see the newer top sections a little lighter colored than the older base section, though they will darken over time with exposure to sunlight. They'll get another seven coats of varnish after they're installed. I typically apply two maintenance coats at a time, at least three times a year, depending on the environmental conditions. With a few coats of varnish on the combings and winch pads, the installation was straightforward. For more on the complete combing project, take a look at Season 6, Episode 1. I installed the winch bases at the same time I installed the new combings. While this was a time-consuming project, it was neither technically difficult nor particularly complex. I believe it's well within the capabilities of anyone with basic woodworking skills, perhaps access to a table saw and a bandsaw, and some patience. Unless you're resurfacing old pads like I was, you probably won't require a thickness planer. I don't know what it would cost to have a boatyard build new combings and winch pads, but I would guess it would be in the many thousands of dollars, especially if you include the detail work like the bare T-cap rails and the bronze plates. But the materials for the combing rebuild and new pads cost about $350. My hope is this video might give you a few ideas and perhaps inspire you to undertake a similar project yourself. In the next episode, I'll share how to use a heat gun to easily and quickly strip varnish to bare wood, then how to properly sand the surface for maximum adhesion in the unforgiving marine environment, and lastly, how to lay on new varnish for that perfect finish. If you enjoyed this episode of Far Reach Voyages, let us know in the comments. Also, consider liking and subscribing as it tells us you'd like to see more videos and it helps the channel grow. See you in the next episode.